night session. So you've got three minutes per project? Yeah. 15 seconds per slide. Three, Gemma said. Going up to the top really quick. Three, three minutes per project. How many projects? 22. 22. <laughs> you told me 29 about a week ago. 22 is a bargain. Projects. We've got a number of Google projects on the go at the moment. Um, decided to start using Google because well, it was particularly popular. Um, one of the main ones that we started using uh, Google was with Google Plus, um, and we're working with that with project management students using a Google Plus community um, to interact with um, industry managers. So we've got five industry managers, 200 students an awful lot of people involved in this project. What students are doing is the managers are posing problems each week and then the students post solutions to them and they have a competition and the manager decides at the end of each week which is the best um, solution. So we can see we've got these kind of uh, discussions here with um, students and managers. Um, I believe we've had eight problems now so far and they're increasing in complexity. Um, so that was of... That was a week ago, so I think it's now doubled in that time because students have been getting more involved in the project as we've been going. The evaluation for this project is ongoing, so we're really excited to see what comes out of it. We've got some findings from previous ones. But the goal here is, is and uh, I know Paul pointed out this is a bit of a cliche, but to get students try and thinking out, outside the box and thinking creatively and engaging with problems that people actually face in the industry. Um, and now we're going to pass it to Jackie. <laughs> So another of the Google projects is um, using Google Classrooms and Google Apps, which um, is being used in the MBA for Leadership and Management, which at the moment is, is um, being delivered on campus, but they're looking at having a blended and a distance learning option. Um, but it was put together quite quickly. And um, so we were looking at, cla at Google Classroom as an alternative to Moodle, as a different kind of learning environment. Uh, but we're using it with university staff as students on the module, so we're getting a bit of a skewed perspective, so that's perhaps because we've got teachers being taught and evaluating it as a teaching tool as much as a learning tool. Um, and there's a, there's a small group of students using it, um, and it's the first iteration. And um, a lot of the discussion on the tool has been about what, how they could use it. The thing that they seem to find the most useful is not the classroom itself, but the Google Apps that are linked to it. Um, uh, another, another project using Google Classrooms is pre-sessional English, where, where it was used um, where, where it was used to facilitate learning for students, as opposed to Moodle, and also because it gave direct act access to things like YouTube and to Google Docs so that students could collaborate together and work together on their English. Um, they did assignments on, um, on Google, which was um, messy, to say the least. Um, and then there were also issues that were raised. Some of the issues that were raised include issues of data protection, Google owning stuff. Um, formatting became a big problem for students um, because things don't stay the same over Google Docs and Word Docs and everything else. Uh, and one of the other criticisms about using the Google Classroom was that there's a lot of scrolling because everything's linear, so you can't grid things and um, put them in order. So those are the, the immediate findings that we've had. We've had loads of issues with um, data protection and security, mainly because IT don't like us using Google, sorry IT. Um, but we've had loads of issues in the university about the fact that we're using Google products. Um, there is a JISC Janet agreement with Google, which um, seems to cover all those things, but hasn't been um, completely sorted yet. Um, so, but yeah, the discussion around this is going to inform um, our view of learning management systems and learning spaces for students, um, and not always what the staff like is what the students like, not always what the university likes is what the student likes, but we're exploring spaces in which 
learning and teaching can happen. hand out Chromebooks to members of staff to try, members of staff who are students on the MBA module, to try just using Chromebooks with the Google thing and the, um, the jury's still out on that one so we'll let you know what the verdict was but we're looking at them. Now we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, me again now. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about another completely different project, which is sustainable ways to increase higher education students' equal access to learning environments, otherwise known as SWING. Um, it's a collaborative project with, um, with universities in a number of different countries. Most importantly, what we're doing is we're having um, EU universities collaborate with universities in Egypt and Morocco to talk about good practice in terms of... Um, disabled students access to higher education both uh, in the EU and in those countries as well. So it's a really good project as you can see. Uh, we took a guess at 100 international flights between all of the EU countries and Egypt and Morocco but at this point it's probably more than that. One of the main things that we did was um, we all went out to Egypt and Morocco to see what was happening out there, to work with the lecturers and the students out there, and just to say, what is kind of technology do you have at the moment, and um, how is it helping your disabled students? Because one of the big problems that um, students face both here and in Egypt and Morocco is a lack of access to higher education. So we're using assistive technology, which is, assistive te which is technology which supports disabled students in particular. And the reason why we do that is because there's um, something called the medical and um, social model of disability. Medical model assumes that disability comes from, um, you know, a, a disability to that pe person's body. Social model assumes that the disability is actually society's inability to adapt to that and to say that there are certain bodies that should be privileged in society. Um, as you can see, we disagree with that. So one of our key goals was to try and move towards more of a social model um, using what you saw on the previous slide because I'm behind and working very closely with students so I can't remember if this is in Egypt and Morocco, Jacqueline might be able to clarify um, but what was really important to us was to work with students in the universities and say what do you need um, and as part of this project we created assistive technology labs at the three universities in Egypt and Morocco um, to provide technology that was uh, available to all students um, with disabilities so we've got things like um, this, um, increased uh, screen size, that kind of thing. We've got things like braille keyboards, um, braille printers, um, a lot of work um, supporting students with visual impairments because there's the um, highest percentage of students in those particular universities. But also um, things like this iPad, for example, supports students with um, dyslexia by providing different backgrounds. Um, these can also be loaned out to all the students. Um, so what we did was it was really important to us to make sure that we were supporting the students throughout so we undertook um, training with students and with staff to make sure that everyone knew how to use these technologies to figure out what technologies we were missing um, and as part of that we found out it was really important to make sure we were providing ongoing support most importantly for staff because actually the students have been using these technologies already in their home lives so what was important was bringing it into the university also, what was really important was making sure it was available in Arabic because there's a lot of assist assistive technology in um, English language, so in the UK and the US, but we needed to make sure those students were supported as well as we, so we could help students move towards independence outside of the university. So we created uh, a lot of training materials. There's a website that's got everything there. We've got the advisor's training handbook for, um, for staff um, and also the accessibility model reports. So making sure that people can take what we've learned and put it into other universities as well. I think what was fantastic that came from this project though was that we got students working together. So this is an example of a student group that actually set up their own support for assistive technology and are continuing to meet beyond this. So we've still got a lot to do, um, both in the European countries and in the um, Egyptian and Moroccan universities as well, because I think we've learned from them as much as they've learned from us. 
but what's been so important to us is increasing that access. Um, most recently, we've also had um, conferences um, to disseminate what we've learnt in Egypt and Morocco um, at universities in both of those countries, and those have been hugely successful. We've had a lot of impact in there. For example, um, this work is now being taken to the 22 Arab League countries. Um, a lot of policy change, um, I believe, in Morocco. Um, so, making sure that one of the things is that students don't now have to go to um, the hospital to get approval to get access um, to accessibility. Okay, um, if you want to know anything more, um, you can talk to me or to Jacqueline, who is the lead of this project, and we can let you know a bit more about it there. Look at that timing. There you go, my friend. Hello everybody, so uh, my name is Catherine Wimpenny and I'm co-lead for research here in the lab and I wanted to talk with you about a programme of activities that I'm really interested in which is regarding arts related research and pedagogy and as this slide suggests this type of research is really about using arts in the wider sense in order to help us explore um, human action and experience and this really links well with what Anthony was talking about earlier. Um, and I guess my, my research in this area started through collaboration with the Belgrade Theatre when exploring the uh, impact of theatre and performance on health and well-being of people living in Coventry. And using arts-related research, participants would share stories which were then written into scripts um, and performed on stage um, at a number of venues across the city. Um, and also an arts installation was developed in the foyer of the theatre at the Belgrade which really represented people's collective stories about the journey and about being involved. And a follow-on study starts in January for three years to progress that work. So really, arts-related research is about ways to capture experiences that otherwise are difficult to articulate. Um, and I really think it's got immense value for education, not least in how it can bring us closer to learners' experiences. Um, one example is Covent Warwickshire Partnership Trust, who recently commissioned me to work with another artist to look at how we could use this research practice in schools, to look at climates for well-being in schools. And in brief, what we found that arts-related research was really indicated for this community, not least because of its ability to create conditions to support the sharing of what is difficult to talk about, unarticulated feeling and experience. And, and the methods used were used to produce um, intense discussion, I'm shaking so much, um, about expressive mark making and performance. Um, and really what we found was that it gave this authentic testimony. It gave staff and students the opportunity to think about ways collectively to look at well-being. So I'm interested in this idea of bringing together the self and other internal and external influences, um, the opportunity to provoke, to evoke, to challenge, to capture learners' attention. Um, and an area of, of work that I've been looking at is called artography. So this is the coming together of artist, researcher and teacher perspectives. And it's a way of seeing learning as living inquiry, as, as learning that's work in progress, where structure disappears and creative opening is possible. Um, and autography is not a patchwork of different disciplines coming together, um, but really it's more about a shift, a rupture in how new courses of action can unfold. Um, and a project that's focused on this was with art um, law and occupational therapy students and we work with uh, a practitioner from the RSC um, and what was wonderful in this was how we could use Shakespeare to understand disciplinary concepts, to understand the complexity of script but look at how that would help students around thinking about deciphering how Shakespeare had relevance to modern day interpretation but also exploring the subtext of being able to learn together, to look again at disciplinary knowing, um, and thinking about active learning, taking part, being present, um, and opening up ourselves to step out of disciplinary comfort zones. Um, so two other projects that I've been looking at, look at this out of classroom learning experience through the arts, um, is um, disrupting the thesis. And this is a project where we're looking at sociology students. We're going to work with academic staff and myself um, and a film production company to think about ways to disrupt the thesis, to think about how students can represent their thesis working with stallholders in Coventry Market and thinking about film as a medium through which to share learning. Um, another project is Films to Make You Feel Good. Um, wherein we're thinking about second year soci um, communication and media students 
looking at um, providing high quality curated cinema screenings for people who will be considered isolated or vulnerable. Um, and the students were assessed for that piece of live project work. Um, on the 11th of November, just last week, we hosted the Belgrade, um, who helped us think about ways to inspire and prompt curiosity in our teaching. And staff from sociology, engineering, serious games, really engaged experientially to think about taking projects forward. Um, and uh, we've got Wendy Couchman coming in December to look at how we can look at the Herbert Art Gallery as a space in which to think about visual art practice. And Peter Guzwatis is coming in January. And if you were interested in anything I've said today, please come and talk to me and look at the website. And I apologise for shaking like a leaf. But there we go. <laughs> Right, um, and, and one of the things that we are looking at um, within the lab as well is to look at how we can actually use game science in a hybrid space. And it's quite an interesting project to do because there are so many different things that we can actually do within the game concept, especially when you want to move from this particular space where everything is like a one direction sort of, uh, one direction is like the name of a band, but <laughs> one direction sort of interaction with students. And we want to move away from such a confined space to something which is more hybrid and pervasive, where you can actually learn anywhere, everywhere, at any time. This is one thing that is missing um, in our school system at the university, where the experience is not seamless when you actually move from your formal, informal space as well as your social space. So we need three of these key elements in terms of learning to ensure that you would be able to apply what you've learned and to be able to sort of try and see how you can actually extend your knowledge as well. But one thing which is important is to, is to understand motivation. What would motivate a student to learn and sort of try and combine formal and informal spaces as well, as well as social spaces? And within a game concept, we are actually going back to basic, where in the olden days, people learn and play at the same time. Ludus uh, in Latin means learn and play, play and learn. And it does not differentiate the meaning between two of these. So we need to go back to basic and see how someone can actually be um, engaged in a game sort of um, concept uh, designed and they would spend a lot of time playing games and not learning at all. So how can we harness this experience and by looking at the different trends, trends in mobile learning, trends in flipped classroom and trends in gamification, how can we actually use game science to support the different things that we're trying to do within, within the university. So this lab is actually interested in it and trying to look at it in a holistic and modular way where we are actually starting from basic, where we try to understand the problems that we are trying to solve and try and think how can we be creative with it and then move on to, to technology because I believe that we need to be transdisciplinary, working with different people from different backgrounds and try to co-create and co-design solutions for teaching and learning, which I think is very important and it's working um, um, for us at the lab. And this has also informed what we are doing in another project, which is called Imparap, where we are actually working with lecturers as well as students to create um, an app that can help you to learn language. And this has been shown in Game Changers presentation like um, this morning. And this, 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 this is leading to one of the programs that we are running next year starting in January till March next year um, on Game Changers that is actually using this holistic approach in trying to help someone to understand the different things that we can actually do in terms of game design. And we have actually used it within this particular project where we are trying to help the unemployed to look at the different ways of changing their status quo and looking at this situation in a playful manner. And one of the things we are looking at as well in terms of technology, we are looking at how can we use gamification to support crowd um, teamwork and we are trying to look at the, the differences between collab collaboration and competition which which we find very interesting and there are three key things that came out from the different things we're doing the first one is assessment it is very important to understand how are we going to assess progress as well as how can we provide feedback and personalization is very important as well as serendipity but to support 
three of the different things that I mentioned, it will be quite messy. We have to work with a huge ecosystem of people who are from different backgrounds, different expertise, different technology that we can, we can use. We should not start from scratch. I think we should reuse every single thing that, that is out there. And this is what we're trying to do in Beaconing Project, uh, a project that we managed to win this year, 5.9 million, um, worth 5.9 million, 15 partners for three years. 5.9 million, and, <laughs> and this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to extend the experience from a classroom setting into outdoor, and outdoor space can be your personal space as, uh, as well. So I think we, it is very important to, to, to provide a liquid, a more liquid, a more seamless experience, and there are three key stakeholders that we want to work with. Um, parents, um, learners, as well as teachers, because these are the three key people who are basically benefiting from the experience and the fact that what we want to provide this partnership, it will be a, a, an ecosystem that is worth supporting. So in conclusion, in terms of game science in a hybrid learning space, we need to provide physical experience, mental challenge, social experience is key to understanding the different knowledge that you have gained and immerse it in a context is very important. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Daniel and this is my first Ignite talk. Um, I also have a pretty bad cold, so stay away from me and I will try to be <laughs> slow. I'm here wearing two different hats. Uh, I work for the Center for Global Engagement, also in Coventry University, as Online International Learning Program Manager. And I'm here at the lab working as one of the pro principal project leads. Now you have 15 seconds to say anything about Global Bradley. Keywords, attributes? Creative, mm -hmm. Creative yes. Um, enterprising. Okay. Resilient. Okay, well, uh, today we'll be focusing on two different sets. One is digital skills, and I'm sure that you are familiar with uh, this idea of uh, navigating comfortably the, the new media landscape in which we all live these days. The other set of competences is intercultural competence, and this is the, uh, the ability to communicate and behave effectively and appropriately uh, across cultures using knowledge, attitudes, uh, and uh, skills. So um, today we'll be talking about a project which uh, looks at the intersection of these two different sets of uh, skills. And uh, the idea is that, uh, well, sorry, this is a, this is a series of um, uh, skills that were um, employers uh, indicated that these are the key skills that they want to see relating to intercultural competency when they hire uh, employees. So virtual mobility um, is a way of providing students with opportunities to develop both intercultural competencies and digital skills at the same time. I don't like the notion of virtual very much, but, uh, but I think that these days is a kind of a mainstream uh, term so the idea of virtual mobility or online international learning or collaborative online international learning, um, um, cultural, online intercultural uh, exchanges, there are many different ways of talking about this. But the point is that uh, students have the opportunity to interact with peers at other universities using different platforms, different um, from Moodle to social media. Uh, it's not about the technologies, but it's about the, having the opportunity to work collaboratively with peers um, around the world. Um, so here in Coventry University, we have this uh, large project uh, targeting uh, a really large number of students, at least as compared with other universities. And... Um, we try to connect this with the curriculum, so students don't develop these skills detached from the formal curriculum, but it's embedded and connected with the different modules that they are following as part of their courses. And there are different steps, and the first start working with lecturers uh, into identifying the learning outcomes that they would like to connect with this, because it's not about creating something extra, it's about uh, working to internationalize the curriculum. And, and develop new activities. So at the moment we are working to try to share expertise across the university, uh, and then for example we have now created a new website that will help 
to share information across the different actors in the university and also externally. These are some of the tools. And with my DMLL hat, I'm going to be working, trying to come up with new models, new ways of doing this, rather than using just the traditional technologies, Moodle or social media platform. We would like to explore new ways of doing this, reaching a, a larger num number of students and also exploring uh, new technologies. These are other keywords that uh, relate to some of the projects that I would like to develop here at the lab. So if you are interested in ICT enhanced mindfulness, for example, or exploring uh, privacy network at environment, <coughs> uh, feel free to approach me and then I would be happy to discuss ideas. Uh, and somewhere I read that uh, reading about how to prepare an Ignite talk, that it was a good idea to leave a spare slide at the end. So this is my, <laughs> my extra uh, slide after hacking and duplicating <laughs> my last slide. So thank you. <laughs> Another of the projects that I'm working on is Open Badges, which are um, a digital manifestation of, uh, of skills or learning or knowledge. So a lot of people, when we, say, when we say badges, you think about things like a Blue Peter badge or a Scout or Guide badge. Um, somebody showed the Blue Peter badges a week ago at a conference in America and it didn't go down very well. Um, so it's a bit, it's a digital certificate, but the advantage of the badging system is that actually if it's, a di if it's a, an open digital badge, it has the credentials behind it. So you don't just get a piece of paper, you get evidence of what it was you had to do to get it and what you did. So you can show what you actually did. Um, lots of um, industry partners have begun to look at it as well and, and have supported badging and are looking at expanding their own badges or working with us. So on the project, we've got me, we've got Ollie and Lauren who aren't here just now. I don't know where they've disappeared to. Um, and then we've got a number of university projects working with students. So uh, we've got one working with um, advantage modules, with um, uh, skills and uh, with computing science students. We're running our own advantage module, which you can't possibly read what all that says. But basically, there's four, out four learning outcomes three of which are linked to badging, and the fourth one says collect badges. So these are the badges that we're giving students. Students work in teams. There's no content to the module. It is simply um, come and decide what you want to learn, work out how you learn it, work in teams, learn stuff, and then share it with everybody else, and they get badges for each of those steps. Uh, we've been working with Credly to design the badges and implement them. So we have a system set up where all the badges for all the different um, projects across the university all come through Credly and they're all DMLL branded so that everybody gets the same sort of badge um, and on the Credly system you put in the criteria for the badge and then you can award them when the students meet the criteria they can upload the evidence that they've met the criteria we can award them individually or in big groups um, and the badges can then be taken into, you can use them in other spaces. So you take them from your Credly account, you can put them into a Mozilla backpack, which is, I guess, a bit an, an analogy is like your sleeve when you're a scout. So you can show off what your badges are. They work on LinkedIn as well, because they're all the same company, really. And uh, people can endorse them. So the other side of that is that you take your badge, you go and do an, an internship somewhere or, or a professional engagement, and you're, um, you're your mentor can then endorse the skills that you've got. Um, we have simple badges, so you'll get a badge for attending this event, so you get an idea of what badges are about. Um, clearly, that's very different to having a badge where you had to learn lots of skills. So we came up with this a really bad slide because the images are not clear, but what we've come up with is a hierarchy of different shapes to show the different types of badges and um, a progression from basic to very advanced which we're still working on and we're open to ideas about them. Um, badges are only as good as the rigour of the system that you're building. So we need to build um, momentum for the badging system. We need to get it more widely uh, understood and, and used. Um, it's got loads of great potential. It can be used to identify skills that industry needs so we can have students who go out and say, look, I've got this skill and you can see really clearly that they've got it. Uh, we can match industry skills so industry can come and say 
this is what they want, um, and we can provide it. An example that I saw recently was it's absolutely useless to an employer to have a transcript of a student's studies that says they did module 204 AB um, in computing and they got 65% because it doesn't show what they actually learned. So badges are a way of showing what you actually learned in that module or outside that module. Um, again, the challenges are about building the, this momentum, this movement, so that we get a growing sense of badging across the country. There's other, sp other places that are using it. Mark from um, from Make Waves is, is pushing really bad, really um, into HE now, and um, he has his Open Badges Academy, which we're going to work with. And there's growing momentum in higher uh, in primary and secondary education. And does anyone have any questions? Because I've finished. <laughs>